Okay. So uh, yeah, I'm Joseph and I'm here to present on continuously delivering full stack JavaScript. Okay, so a bit about myself, I'm a software engineer at GDS GovTech Singapore and if you want to hit me up for business, pleasure, stalking, you're free to. Slides are licensed under Creative Commons and if I'm a bad presenter, there's an article over here which you can go and read up. Okay, so someone told me once, start with why. So, if code is written but never deployed, was it ever really written? Okay, so let's say we have that one big idea. So let's say you, you've written your test, tests are passing, I mean you write tests, right? So then what? Okay, so my personal story was I used to be in a music entertainment startup. We got our revenues from holding events and getting people to tip us, to tip the musicians and we took a commission out of it. So that night the stage was, was set and ready to go, we had a crowd of about 100, the backpack was up and everything, and then boom, 10 seconds page load time. And as we know, five seconds is more or less like internet infinity. So don't be like me. So good delivery me methodologies will allow us to have improved business agility, either through, like, through being able to frequently update the application, like pivot, and it also reduces the potential for business loss through lesser downtime and improves your user experience. Okay, so I took a check on LinkedIn as well, and here are some stats. So for software architects, there's 13,000 jobs and there's 281,000 talents. So assuming all things equal, assuming everyone is telling the truth, there's only a 4% chance to get a job. So, so on and so forth, down the value chain, and then let's take a look at DevOps and Ops. So you can see, literally it's 50,000 over 49,000. And collectively, DevOps and Ops, there's a 78% chance. So I hope that convinces you. And yeah, one more thing, GovTech is hiring as well for DevOps and Ops. Okay, so continuous delivery, the first big word. So it's about getting the goods to the users consistently and it's a concept in, sorry, it's a concept in agile development. So agile development is an iterative development cycle of running through business objectives, writing user stories, writing the code, delivering, getting feedback. And as most agile evangelists will tell you, change is the only constant. Okay, so for us technical, people, we, we are concerned with the development work and the build, test, release, deploy cycle. So our aim is to enable frequent deployments in, to production, to reduce the time taken to production, and to reduce human intervention during deployments. And we do this through a continuation, continuous integration and continuous delivery pipeline. So this is actually triggered on a commit code push, and then it automates the build, test, release, and deploy. So you can think of it as taking the input as a code commit, and showing out a deployment. Okay, so deployments, what is it and what is it not? So firstly, deployments expose high-level features. So this is basically a snapshot of your code base. You can reference it by hash or by version if you've implemented it. It also configures the behavior of your application. So think of it like your node environment, node and your database connections. And it targets specific stakeholders for your application. So let's say developers may access it at dev.myapp.com, product owners may access it at user acceptance, testing, deployment. And lastly, it defines the infrastructure and, av and availability. So for example, like what base system are we using? Is it CentOS? Is it Ubuntu? How many VM instances should be running? How are we going to update our applications? So what it looks like is something like this. So you get your services, your applications, which is handled by the deployment manager, which extracts away the VM layer. So there are many, each of these circles is one application instance. So if you think about it, like when a request comes into the load balancer, it, the load balancer will route it to one of these instances randomly. So for the updating, which I mentioned about earlier, so blue-green deployments, you can take the blue as the old version of the code and the green as the new version. So why deployments are important is because it allows us to have zero downtime. So let's say for example we have eight at the start. So when we are updating our code, we can actually down four of them while upping another four. So we will always have eight which are available to accept requests. So this goes on and on in the same fashion until we reach the fully updated state. Yeah, and what is it not? So it's tempting to think of deployments as the environment, but don't do that. Don't correlate your environments with deployments because environments defines the product behavior. Deployments is much more. So for example, and we don't just deploy to production. For example, in our team, we're actually deploying to development after a successful build. 
to a quality assurance environment after unit and system test pass, so on and so forth. Yeah, so here are some common tools that we are actually using. For example, for VMs, there's PM2, and we are using NodeMon to monitor our node applications. Yeah, so you can, you can access my slides at the URL, which I'll show you later. Yeah, so these are all links, you can check them out. A bit tight on time. Okay, so how did we do it? Something that has worked, hopefully continues working. So our product architecture consists of two applications, one front end and one back end. So our front end is a React.js application and our back end is an Express application with Swagger. Yep. So developers develop in the local development and then they push the CI pipeline which automates everything up to the deployment. So Nectar is our own in-house government deployment engine, which is actually stands for Next Generation Container Architecture. Yep. So you can see that first we run the unit test and then we do continuous integration, deploy to a QA environment, thereafter integration testing. And finally, we deploy to a staging environment. If that's fine, then we go on to the production deployment. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to some practical tips that is born of that is born from mistakes that we made. So we failed pretty badly at the start, but so these are tips to help you not make the same mistakes that we made. So our objectives were to allow developers to push often, deploy easily and frequently, and reduce time to production. Okay, so how do we write deployment-friendly code? Okay, so first is one code base, many deploys. So always keep your application separate, have one CI pipeline. So this reduces the length it takes to go through the pipeline and it avoids a single point of failure. So assuming our back end had some issue, our front end still can get deployed if the checks have passed. Yeah, so another is to isolate your dev dependencies. So inside your package JSON, there's actually a dependencies and a dev dependencies property. So use this, use this to define your production and development dependencies. Because when you do that, you can actually lazy load your development dependencies and exclude it from the production build. So I think most, no tutor, most JavaScript tutorials will, will actually teach you to eager load, which is to put your dependencies first. So what we found was to actually put them inside the code blocks, inside development specific code blocks so that we could actually package our apps without the development dependencies. So for example, things like Webpack take up a lot of space. So we exclude it by doing it like this. Yeah, so next is use a log file, and PM5 comes with one, young comes with one, and it helps us to avoid, it works on my machine kind of problems. Okay, environment management, keep the configuration out of the code. So use your process.env. So it might be tempting to, like for example, if you want to listen to different ports on, in different environments, it might be tempting to write it like this, but don't do this, let the deployment handle it. The application should only define the behavior, not how it happens. Okay, so and so we can do this by having a .env file. So that's through the .env npm package for local development environments. So for actual deployments, use Docker Compose and Kubernetes. They allow you to inject, and I'll show you how later. Okay, so um, yeah, an exception is for development tools. So let's say you want to have Webpack hot middleware. It doesn't make sense to put it in outside of the code block. Okay, next is to minimize development and production parity. So this is about keeping the behavior the same. And so how we do this is through usage of adapters. So this is just one example. So you can see that the code always remains the same, no matter how we behave. Yeah, the code always remains the same. And it is defined by the environment. So for example, we can choose a MySQL adapter or we can choose a Postgres adapter. And then we require it, and then we set up a new database. So you can see the, the code is very short and clean, and the configuration is done by the environment. So and for persistent data, so one way that we handle this is through database migrations. So you can think of database migrations as more incremental changes in the database schema that is written in code. And this can be put in your repository, which means it can be versionable. So this means that if let's say you have a version 1.0.0 with three migrations, we can be very certain that the database looks the same as when you run the, th the three migrations. And migrations generally have an up and down, up and down functions. So up would be something like create a table, and down would be something like drop the table. Yeah. So the current tools of the trade for JavaScript is Next and SQLize. Next is a query builder, and SQLize is a <coughs> object relation mapper. And you can see that we can actually define what a table looks like in code. Okay, so the next tip for process management, keep the application stateless. So avoid things like PID log files and avoid multiple service connections because these take time to shut down when your application receives, for example, a sick term. Okay, so how we can do this is through an, a single term pattern. So if it's not instantiated, instantiate it. 
If not, just return it. And, meet, and keep the connection count to one. For authentication, prefer JSON web tokens over sessions. And if you really need to use sessions, put it as an external service because this means that your application can be shut down and updated very quickly. And the last tip for development is to log everything and log it to standard output. So this avoids file-based logging where if your application needs to shut down suddenly for updates, it can actually shut down everything at once. Okay, so in summary, one code based on application, isolate and lazy load dev dependencies, use the log file, keep the configuration of the code, version your data, use stateless authentications, and log to standard output. Okay, so next, building. Yeah, so include what's needed and let it be enough. So the first step is to build in an, in an encapsulated environment. So we had the issue of when we built something on Mac and then we ran it on Windows and the whole thing just broke down. So our solution was to use a Docker file because you can actually specify a certain operating system here. So for example, like Alpine or CentOS, and you can trust that the binaries will be the same. So next is to version your dependencies. So this one, was, this one happened because our builds were taking very, very long. So one commit easily took like 20, 30 minutes because it was waiting for other CI runners to complete running the job. So we solved this by actually hashing the log file and then trying to pull it using the hash as a version from a Docker registry. So if it existed, it pulls. We use that Docker image to build our eventual application. And if it didn't exist, only then we run the build. Because the npm run install, I believe, takes two to three minutes for our application. Yeah. So this is what it looks like. Lah. So dependencies, you build it, and you just copy in your log files, build it. And then for the actual application building, we draw from this image over here. And we just copy in the code, and it's good to go. Okay, so because we are using React, we are using Webpack, and we, are, we use Uglify for code compression. So this actually takes out like invisible paths. Yeah, and I'm not too sure exactly what other optimizations it does. Okay, so next is bundle compression. So this allows you to specify how, do, how is the file going to be compressed when it's traveling over the network. So the example here is gzip, but there's this new compression called broadly. I haven't used it, so I'm not going to recommend it yet. Okay, so next will be code splitting. So code splitting results in faster page load timing. So for example, if you've, you have five pages and the user does not always go to all five pages, so you split it into five pages and the user loads it as they come along. So this improves your initial page load time. And you can also do it by, dependent, by development and production dependencies because dependencies don't change often. So by splitting the code, that one file can actually be cached. Okay, yeah. So we split the code for node modules, for example, the development dependencies. And the reason for doing this is because we can cache it using a client-side cache. So there's this pretty awesome tool of service worker pre-cache by Google, which lets you cache your front-end assets. Yep. So what it looks like in the Webpack plugin is like this, and you can specify whatever files that you want to cache. So any files within this glob changes, it will cache bus, and your users will download the new versions. In the front end, it's simply three lines of code. You just register the service worker. Yep, so in summary, version your dependencies, minify and optimize the code, compress it, split the code by change frequencies, split the code by features, and implement client-side caching. Okay, automated testing. Okay, I'll run through this really quickly because I think I'm running out of time. So yeah, automated testing is required to prevent things from breaking too quickly. So first, static analysis. We do this by ESLint. And we use Google Config for normal for our backend and Airbnb for React. So the next thing that ESLint can actually do is to scan for security vulnerabilities in the code by ESLint scan JS config. And it's implemented in a simple ESLint RC which can place in your project root. Okay, so next is the unit and system test. I think this is pretty standard mocha framework. For the front end, we use Karma. For the back end, we use uh, the standard mocha runner. And integration tests. So these are actually happy path tests. So we, are, we initially use CodeSet, but eventually we switch to robot. So CodeSet is purely JavaScript and it looks something like this, very human point of view. So let's say your user came in from Facebook. You can say that he should be on this page, UTM campaign Facebook. He should see login via Facebook. He can click on it, and then he will end up on the page. So for non-functional verification, we have GetLink for load testing. For security vulnerabilities, we are using Nessus actually, but a good open source alternative is actually W3AF. Yep. So automated tests serve to make sure your code is maintainable, maintain the security. So write your unit and system tests, let it run inside the CI pipeline. Your integration tests, load tests, and penetration tests. 
Okay, so on releasing, releasing is about crafting well-defined deployments. So first thing is use sample because everyone else uses it. Most people should know what it means. Patch version for bug fixes, minor for non-breaking changes, and major version for breaking changes. So next is to avoid package.json. This was tempting and we actually did it and this was very troublesome once our team scaled because every push to the CI pipeline resulted in another code commit which required us to pull it back again just for that one version change. So the solution that we found was to use git tags. So you can add a git tag, you can view it with this command, it's pretty simple. And I've actually written a, a package to help with this process. So you can initialize a repository, you can get the latest, and then you can iterate through the patch, minor or major versions. Okay, so next is using Docker for immutability. So we need to keep the package immutable. So we create it using a Docker file and then we push it with the version as the tag. So in our deployment, in our final deployment environment, you can actually just pull this container. Okay, so summary for releasing use sample, avoid using package JSON, use your git text to version instead, and package your application immutably. And the last one on deployment. Okay, so getting it out there and ensuring it stays up. Okay, so first thing to know is implement your infrastructure as code because this empowers developers. It helps to cultivate DevOps and Ops as a shared responsibility. So for example, using Kubernetes, we can actually deploy using just one command. All our infrastructure is defined inside there. Okay, so for the base system, we are still using Docker. And thereafter, we deploy using Kubernetes. So you can see that we are actually pulling from a Docker re registry. And we can also specify environments inside our spec files. So okay, all these are actually trimmed for brevity. It's actually much longer in between the lines. Okay, so and yeah, this is, the, this is for scaling. So for example, we can see here there are 30 replicas. And max unavailable specifies how many can actually go down at one time. So at any one point in time, our application went 15 instances. Yep. So this keeps it up with no downtime. And yeah, lastly is to expose your application via port binding. So for example, if our application is on port 3000, just leave it as 3000, let the deployment handle the job of implementing SSL. Okay, so service management, there are three types of services. First is the application service, which is the code you're writing for, backing services like your databases and administrative services. So things like migrating the database, updating it with new data. So for your application and backing services, we can deploy using the spec file as seen above. And as for admin services, you can use things like a job spec file, which allows you to specify like a certain interval at which to run the code. Okay, so one thing to note is to configure for quantity because Node is single-threaded. So we implement, con we have concurrency by scaling outwards, by having as many instances as possible. So we do this in order to let them die on memory leaks because it's not a matter of if, but when. Okay, so setting memory bounds is something like this. So you can see that we're setting CPU 0 0.15 CPU and 100 milli CPU over here. So what this means is that when it spins up your request for this amount, and once it reaches this amount, it will get killed and then it will start up again. So this keeps your applications fresh, and which is why you need to keep your application stateless. Yep. Okay, so in summary, define the base system with Docker, define the infrastructure with Kubernetes. We use deployments for backing apps and services, services for exposing the deployments. We use jobs for admin services, focus on quantity when scaling, and let memory leaks die. And one last thing, don't deploy on Fridays. We did that once and it was a terrible experience. Okay, so thank you. That is all. <laughs> okay, any questions? Yes. Uh, so you mentioned a little bit about accessibility testing, and you said some tool you're using, but you went really fast, so I couldn't catch it. Yeah, uh, the time was running out. Okay, uh, which slide was that? Take your time, take your time. Which slide was that? You tell me, it's like 500 slides ago. <laughs> It was in testing, is it? Well, yeah, just this one, just this one. Yeah. Could you tell me more about that? The penetration testing? Or the oh, load okay. testing? Okay, yeah, I, I, I mean, I misheard it, sorry. I thought it was accessibility. So oh, right, right, what, okay. What does this do? Okay, so for penetration, okay, so the question was, what does penetration testing do? So what this does is actually to automate scripts that, automate scripts to try and hack your site. So for example, stuff like um, cross-site inject, cross-site, Scripting, yeah. So it will try like my, my SQL commands inside all your fields and everything, automated, yeah. Yep, so the load testing was actually to determine, remember earlier the loads, 
the resource limits. Yeah, so we actually use this load testing to see how much load should each one take. So we will check like the spikes, how far does the memory spike, and then we will set that as a limit because we don't want we don't want our applications to shut down <coughs> unexpectedly during spikes. Yeah. Yes. You didn't mention, do you use anything for uh, monitoring the CPU usage, memory usage on the server? Oh, that, that, that's actually, okay, so the question was, do we use anything to monitor CPU usage? So that actually is part of Kubernetes dashboard. I can't access it because this is my personal laptop. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have it. Yeah, but Kubernetes actually has, actually has a nice dashboard where you can see the memory usage of your applications, how many network requests are there, how many, how much CPU and how much memory is using as well. Yeah. So yes, at the back. Is this a manual test or do you put it as high as CICD? It's actually part of the CD, CICD pipeline. So we actually run through the application as a human. We will note down what API calls are made to the backend. And then from there, we will simulate these calls by writing code for it. And then that is one user. So we specify, let's say if you want to test for 50 users, we take this workflow and then we run through it 50 times concurrently onto the server and see how the server performs. So I think some metrics would be like how long it takes to respond, what does the memory look like, yeah, things like this. Yep, any other questions? We still have time if you have questions. Yes. Where's your Kubernetes and database deployment? Is that in-house or you do some self service? Yeah, we, we have to use in-house, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I've never seen Do you yeah. deploy your database using Kubernetes or do you isolate some partition and your hard disk? Okay, so the question was, do we, how do we do the database, is it? Yeah, so where is our database stored? So um, our application is deployed on Kubernetes. In our testing environments, we're actually using RDS. Yeah, Amazon RDS. And inside Nectar, which is our internal deployment environment, they actually provide something like what AWS provides. Yeah, so there's, we have an internal sort of RDS. Yeah. <coughs> yes. How the stack looks like? Okay, I think application stack. Okay, I don't have anything on that. So, what do you want to know about our stack? Mm. Okay, okay. So, um, so because we have two applications, we treat this so-called as it's more of service oriented instead of microservices for now. So this was done with microservices in mind in future. So if we actually do get there, I'll come back and give another talk on it. So right now it's just two applications, one backend API and one front end website. Yep. Yeah. Did, did I answer the question? Yeah. So for your data mm. cases, you have a separate stack for each environment. So that in your QA, you have a separate QA database. Yes, that is correct. So for each deployment, there will actually be a different database instance that it connects to. Yeah. One last question. Yeah. Uh, yes. Do you store your application firewalls and where do you keep them? Okay, so the question is where do we store the logs? So our logs uh, are actually streamed to the console. So basically we just do a console log and we leave it there. So what actually happens when you have that many instances is that each of these instances, okay, so these instances will be put onto VMs allocated by the deployment manager, which in our case is Kubernetes. So from there, each of them will actually be, there's actually a central logs collator for all these, a fluent D. Yeah, correct. Yep, is there any other questions? Thank you very much. Okay, if not, thanks for listening.